and it's really a pleasure to have an opportunity to share uh, my work with you. Um, I always struggle with Zoom with the, these um, bars that appear on, on top of the screen. So is, is the black bar blocking you from the screen now? Hold on. Okay, it should be okay now. Um, so, so what I would like to present today, and I, I really appreciate the, the opportunity to share this work with you, is some work that we have done with Ignacio Arana at, at Carnegie Mellon and Melanie Hughes, um, uh, my old colleague in the Department of Sociology at the University of Pittsburgh. Hola, um, ¿qué tal? Ten, ten, bien, tenés un segundito para que te diga algo. <laughs> sí. Bueno, porque estábamos revisando las cosas ahora, y así cuando yo estoy escuchando lo que... And sorry, and so um, what we are, what the, the work we are presenting today is um, some work that uh, relates to um, the question of um, to what extent there is a there is a pos the possibility that in some ways weak institutions, fragile institutions, will give us an opportunity to be more inclusive. So it, it's sort of a paradoxical. Um, principle, but, but it's something that we would like to explore, and, and you will see how, where, where this comes from. Um, the, just to give you an example of this, um, of, of, the, of this idea, in November of last year, Rasio Barbitsky, who is a, a very famous um, journalist and, and investigative journalist and, and human rights activist in Argentina um, on the left, um, published a blog post um, mentioning some discussion in the, in the current Argentine government about the possibility for some judicial reforms. And the first paragraph of the, of the blog post can, kind of emphasized that a commission created by the president in Argentina, uh, was, there was some discussion that it was planning to recommend the extension of the court from five to nine members, the, the Argentine Supreme Court. And the principle of that reform would be that the new reform would require gender parity. Um, and so that meant, uh, Berbitsky concluded, that the new, the new four members that would be added to the Supreme Court would be women. Uh, and so in addition to the, to the one justice who is already a woman, that would mean that five of the, of the nine members would be women. And so this would be, he said, the first court with a majority of women in the world and the first Supreme Court. And so this would be kind of a fantastic principle for, for judicial reform. What is really interesting about this, so this is a really interesting motivation for the judicial reform. But what is really interesting about this blog post is that once you read the rest of the blog post, the author says nothing else about gender parity in the court. And, and the rest of the discussion is all about kind of the problem that the, govern, the current government has with the Supreme Court and the, and the manipulation of the, of the Supreme Court during the previous government and all that, right? So in some ways, it, what, is, what is strange is that the there seems to be this justification for judicial reform based on gender that in principle is a reason to expand the size of the court. But when you read the, re the rest of the article, in some ways it's, it, the, the principle behind the reform seems to be packing the court more than anything else. So in some ways, the, the question that motivates the, 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 the research I'm presenting today and the article we wrote is, is it possible that having weak institutions like, like courts that can be packed or manipulated, when they are combined with progressive leadership, facilitate the access of excluded groups to power? This is the general theme of the, of, of the general theoretical question. And the specific application in which we are exploring this, this question is the context of um, the presence of women justices in Supreme Courts and constitutional courts in Latin America, following the example of Argentina I just mentioned. Uh, and when you look at the, the progression of, of women in the high courts in Latin America, women were only 3% of Supreme Court justices in 1980 across the region, but they were almost 20% by, by 2010. So, there has been a consistent in, increase in the number of women in, in high courts, but of course, this is still far away from being um, anything close to parity. Now, explanations for um, the presence of uh, women justices in, in Supreme Courts or, or um, 
women in, in courts more generally tend to follow the more traditional set of explanations that uh, are used to explain the presence of women in different institutional settings. So there is a traditional set of explanations that are based on what we generally call supply, that is the presence of, of qualified women for the positions who are, are willing aspirants to occupy those positions. And in the case of Supreme Courts, um, it's the, the, the meaning of supply is very straightforward, right? The, it, it implies that the legal profession has a, a large number of women and, and those women are, are willing to occupy those positions. And so, so the presence of women lawyers is clearly one of, would be a, a clear indi indicator of supply, but this is, the, there are others of course. And, and there is an extensive literature that emphasizes this type of factor in different contexts. There are of course explanations based on demand. For example, the presence of a, of a critical mass of women in the legislature potentially indicates that not only that women have occupied positions of power in, in the country already, but also that they may be willing to form some sort of coalition to promote women judges into the Supreme Court, right? Um, and then of course, there are more general institutional arguments related, for example, with the, um, with the nature of the appointment procedure. There is a literature that emphasizes that when, the, when appointment procedures for, for Supreme Court justices are more visible, politically speaking, uh, politicians have more incentives to claim credit for appointing women for, for Supreme Court uh, positions or constitutional court positions. Um, there is a more recent ongoing work by, by uh, um, Escobar Lemon and others who tends, shows that this is probably more true for advanced industrial democracies than for new democracies. But, but generally, the, the argument ab ab about appointments has been very common. Of course, there is a possibility of quotas uh, for judicial um, uh, positions. Quotas for Supreme Courts uh, have been very rare in Latin America only. Uh, Bolivia and Ecuador have adopted them, but there's uh, still there would be an explanation. Uh, the, the argument that we explore in this paper, in addition to those uh, potential explanations, the, the main argument we explore in this paper, however, is an argument that originates in the work of, of Melanie Hughes um, in the past. And what she found was that many instances of institutional disruption, for example, civil wars or transitions to democracy, Quite often, precisely because they disrupt the, the, the statu quo in existing institutions, um, quite often what they generate is an opportunity for women to access those positions of power. So, for example, the number of women in legislatures tends to be higher in many occasions after civil wars because the traditional structure of legislatures gets, gets disrupted, right? So, based on this, on this insight, what we explore in this uh, article is whether judicial reshuffles, that is uh, the reshuffling of Supreme Courts, is an opportunity for women to access power. And what we mean by reshuffles is the following. It's a situation in which, which as you will see, is quite, has been quite common in Latin America, in which for some reason that sometimes it's hard to identify, a majority of the justices of the Supreme Court leaves the court in any given year at once. Um, and what is distinctive of a judicial reshuffle is that this doesn't happen by design, by constitutional design. That this is not, in some constitutions, justices have fixed terms in office and they fix their terms concurrently. And so they leave office together because it's the end of their terms, right? What we mean by judicial reshuffles is a situation in which we observe a majority of the court leaving office at once, leaving the court at once, but not because the constitution mandates them to do so. So that usually means that they were kind of pushed to retire or given incentives to retire or threatened to retire or there was some or some combination of those factors, right? Um, now, the, a, a judicial reshuffle creates vacancies in the court. And so those vacancies could be, a, could be filled by anyone, right? And so the implication of judicial reshuffles usually is they will be filled by, by new justices who are loyal to the new government or to the incumbent government. But of course, that doesn't guarantee that women will have an opportunity to occupy those positions. And so the, well, although judicial reshuffles create the opportunity, 
then the key fact, the key additional factor is the motivation to nominate women. And, and here we, we claim that there is a second factor that becomes relevant, which is that if a left party is in power, this is a, the partisan element in the story, if a left party is in power, so if, if a left party is, is prompting the reshuffle, so to speak, then that party will have incentives to nominate women um, to the Supreme Court or Constitutional Court, in part because their voters, their constituencies, and, and the international audiences that suppose that support those left parties in power more will be um, will be more supportive of that move, right? So either for sincere reasons, because left parties want to promote women more for ideological reasons or for strategic reasons, because it's a way of justifying the, the, the judicial purge in front of their constituencies, national and international, it seems that left parties potentially would be more willing to support um, the nomination of women when a reshuffle takes place. So essentially it's a combination of those two factors that we theorize is likely to promote women to the high courts. What we are observing here is the, the 26 courts we are, we are analyzing during this period um, throughout Latin America. And so these are in some countries like Argentina, there is only a Supreme Court that is the, the highest court. In, in other countries like Bolivia, there is historically a Supreme Court, but also a constitutional court created in the 1990s. So in those cases, we observe both courts, the Supreme Court as, high, as the higher court of appeals, and the Constitutional Court after it was created. In Brazil, we have the, the Supremo Tribunal Federal and the, and the uh, Supreme Tribunal of Justice, which is the, the equivalent kind of, of a highest court of appeals created in the, in the late 80s. Um, and what you see in this, in this graph, is, which is the blue line, is the proportion of women or the percentage of women um, justices in the high court over time, the evolution of, of, of the percentage of women over time. Um, and the vertical bars, the, the, the orange bars, are the events of reshuffling the court. So these are moments, those are particular years when a majority of justices, as I said before, leave the court, not because the constitution mandates them to do so, but for some other reason that is often hard to identify with precision. And what you can see is that, first of all, the, the number of women in Supreme Courts has increased progressively. The sequence starts in 1961, by the way, because this is the first year when a woman was appointed to a Supreme Court. This, the first woman to be appointed to a Supreme Court was in Mexico in 1961. So we start the, the process in 1961, the analysis in 1961. And what you can see is that the number of women is, has increased in some countries over time, particularly in recent years, and also that reshuffles have been a common event over time in Latin America, right? And, and the case of Ecuador, Ecuador's constitutional court, Ecuador is a classic case of uh, high levels of judicial instability, but the, the case of, of the constitutional court in Ecuador kind of illustrates a pattern that we see in many other countries, which is in early years, reshuffles made no difference, essentially in the number of women. But it seems that in recent years, some reshuffles may have been an opportunity to increase the number of women in the constitutional court. And this in a way makes sense in the context of our argument because this is the period of the, of the pink wave in Latin America, right? This is the period in the case of Ecuador when Correa is in power uh, in, in Bolivia and another, or, or Venezuela and other places is the period when left governments are in power. So there is a, there is a context in which reshuffles always took place in, in some countries more than others. But in recent years, those reshuffles happened in contexts in which the left was in power and the left appeared to have potentially more incentives to appoint women um, to, to the courts. So this is essentially what we want to explore. The, the analysis we're going to perform is think about a, a database in which we have identified units of analysis that are courts in particular years. So each of those courts that you're observing in the screen observed every year from 1961 um, until, the, until uh, 2014, I think. 
And for every year, for every year in every court, we have identified the percentage of justices who are women, and we have identified years in which reshuffles take place. That is when the majority of justices leave office without, um, without the constitution mandating them to do so. Notice by the way that this is different from packing the court, which is the situation that I was describing before um, in the case of Argentina that implies expanding the size of the court. The cases in which we are, that we are identifying as reshuffles are cases in which justices leave office. It's not that the, the size of the court increases necessarily. Um, and, and so we identify the year of reshuffles and we also identify who is in power, who is the incumbent government in that year and we call whether the party in government belongs to the left or not. So the, the initial analysis we conduct is a, a difference in difference estimator. So we, we have the, the main variable is a variable, a dichotomous variable that captures whether in any of those years there is a reshuffle and the government is on the left. And then we control for the different, the different courts and we control with dichotomous variables and control for the different years to capture time trends. And, and we observe the effect of the reshuffle conducted by the left on the year immediately after the, the reshuffle takes place. And what we observe is the number of, on average, the, the percentage of women in the court increases by about 5%. So it's not a huge increase, but it's a significant increase, right? The average over time and so over many countries. So it suggests that actually reshuffles conducted when conducted by the left, they seem to increase um, the percentage of women in the court. Now, this is just on the year afterwards, right? We would expect that the number of the percentage of women in the court would remain over time, but also it could decline back to the original levels due to attrition or resignations and so on. So something that we also do is we observe, we measure this effect not only in the following year, but within the next five years and within the next decade. And what we observe there is that when we analyze the effect over longer periods after the following the reshuff, those reshuffles, on average, the percentage of women in the courts seems to decline over time. So there is an, an initial increase of about 5%, and then a progressive decline to about 3% over five years and 2% over the next decade. And so it seems that there is, a, there is an initial shock um, that increases the percentage of women in the court as a result of the left conducting the reshuffle, but then that effect declines. So this seems to be the typical pattern that we would observe in dynamic um, models, right? In which the, there is some shock to the dependent variable and that effect carries over time. So we decided to model um, that if the, the effect of, of le left reshuffles also in that way. So we, we are going to, the main models that we develop in this paper are dynamic panel models in which we have two, two main independent variables, right? The, the dummy that captures a year of reshuffling the court. So the majority leaves the court, um, not because they have concurrent terms, but for some other unknown reason. And then we have a dummy that captures whether the government is on the left. And we, we combine information from different sources um, to create a, a five point scale. And so governments on the left are, are below 2.5. Um, and then we control in, in those dynamic panel models, we control for a series of potential confounders. And those potential confounders have to do, first of all, with um, supply factors. The, so the years of schooling for women in the country um, in that particular year, the, the percentage of, of women lawyers in the profession. We also control for potential confounders that represent a potential demand, like the percentage of women legislators, which is a, a, one of the classic explanations for the promotion of women to judicial positions, whether a woman is, a, is the president in the country, and that's a, at, the, at the time, and that's a dichotomous variable, and whether there are judicial quotas for high courts. As I mentioned before, this is very rare, only Ecuador and Bolivia had something like this at different points in time, but of factors, more general factors, one of them is a, is a proxy for sexism in terms of culture in society, which is a, a variable built on, on uh, data from the World Va Value Survey. And then we have a measure from varieties of democracy that captures women participation in civil society. 
a measure of judicial independence, which, which potentially captures the value, the prestige, and the reputation of the court. Um, and then finally, at the level of democracy, using varieties of democracy. So these are our controls in our model. So we developed these dynamic models of women in the high courts. And the dependent variable is the percentage of women in the high courts in any given court in any given year. We, we employ two estimators to, to model those effects. One is a fixed effects, a model with all of these models have a lag of the dependent variable as one of the predictors in the model because they are dynamic panel, panel models. Uh, the fixed effects X estimator adds fixed effects and also has an error term with an outer regressive error term. The, the Arellano bond estimator essentially does the same, but instruments the lack of the dependent variable as a way of, of accounting for potential problems of um, endogeneity in the, in the lack of the dependent variable. But they're essentially doing the same thing. So the, the first model that you're observing here, the first two models are just models in which we have all the control variables plus the lack of the dependent variable in the estimates. And we include the two dichotomous variables for reshuffles and left governments as the main predictors for the percentage of women in the court in any given year. What you can see is that reshuffles, in fact, seem, when taken on, on their own, seem to increase the percentage of women in the high courts. So it seems that weak institutions in some way create an opportunity for excluded groups like women to access power, right? Because, um, because weak institutions in a way undermine the, the status quo of, of the people who control those institutions before, in this case, men. Um, however, left governments on their own do not seem to have a consistent effect on the proportion of women who are appointed to the, to the high courts. Um, and I, I will go back to this in a minute. Now, when we, when we look at the controls, um, it seems that the, the years of schooling for women is an important predictor for the, the percentage of women in the high courts. Surprisingly, the, the percentage of women in the legal profession, not so much. Um, the fact that a woman is present at the time seems to increase the, the proportion of women that are appointed to the high courts. The fact that there are judicial quotas for the high courts, of course, increases the, the proportion of women in the high courts. And interestingly enough, judicial independence uh, seems to have a negative effect on the proportion of women in the high courts. And, and this is a comment that we received from reviewers in this paper, which this, this finding seems to be consistent with some literature that indicates that when institutions are less prestigious and the, those positions are less valued, so to speak, men seem to be more willing to open the space for women, right? So there seems to be kind of a paradoxical element here. Now, the the interesting point, going back to our main variables, is not simply where reshuffles and left governments on their own produce an increase in the women in, in the high courts, but whether reshuffles conducted by left governments produce an increase of women in the high courts. And so we include, in the, in the next set of models, we include the interaction between reshuffle and left between these two dummies, right? And now what you can see is that reshuffles per se do not and if, when reshuffles are conducted by the right, so to speak, they do not increase the, the percentage of women in the high courts. But when reshuffles are conducted by the left, they do, right? And so, so it, it's, this is, seems to be consistent with the argument that reshuffles open the opportunity for women to be appointed, but these leftist governments who have the incentives to appoint women because their constituencies value that, while probably governments on the right do not value that much. The, the, the process that much. So just to give you a, a more concrete sense of what a reshuffle conducted by the left and a reshuffle conducted by the right would mean, uh, let me show you the marginal effects of reshuffles conducted by the left and by parties not on the left. But I, I will just call them the right to, for, for clarity in the exposition. But of course, center parties which are not clearly not left would be part of this group as well. So what you are seeing here in the vertical axis is the short-term change in the percentage of women justices that follows from a reshuffle, right? 
as you can see, and this is essentially the results of the previous table. As you can see, a reshuffle that is conducted by the right or by a party not on the left produces an increase of less than 1% in the percentage of women in the court. And that effect is not significant. It's not statistically different from zero. Now, a, a reshuffle conducted by the left, a part of the court conducted by the left, leads to an increase in the percentage of women in the court of 4.5% on average. So again, it's not a it's not a huge effect, but it's significant and consistent. And this is only the short-term effect. They will get into the long-term effects in a minute. Now, one of the, the questions that we got from, from reviewers and, and people commenting on this paper when we um, obtained those results was, well, do you have any way of knowing whether left parties are promoting women to the court for sincere reasons, that is because they, they have ideological reasons to promote more women, or for strategic reasons, that is because it's a nice way of legitimizing the, the, the purging of the judiciary. And we thought about this, how to, how to get at this, right? We, don't, we do not have direct evidence, except in a few cases, and of course, knowing the motivations of politicians is always very hard, but we, we came to, we, two indirect ways of capturing this. And the two indirect ways is, is, are the following. In addition to reshuffles, politicians do something else to take over the courts. And going back to the initial example for Argentina that I discussed at the beginning of the presentation, one way in which they take over the courts is by packing the courts. That is not by pushing justices to resign, but by expanding the size of the court, right? So if you expand the size of the court from five to nine, then you can appoint for new justices. Um, and so one interesting question was, we, would be to explore what happens if in cases in which the right and the left pack the court, that is expand the size of the court, let's say over 20% the size of the court, allowing them to appoint new justices. And what we find is that in cases of packing, that is when we called rather than reshuffles, we analyze the the impact of events of packing, situations in which politicians expand the size of the court to appoint new justices. What we find is that the pattern is exactly the same that we find for reshuffles, right? When, when legislators expand the size of the court and have an opportunity to appoint new justices, if the packing is conducted by the right, that does not lead to more women. If the packing is conducted by the left, it leads to more women, right? So it seems that there is a consistent pattern in this regard. But then we, there is another situation that, in we, that allows parties to appoint new members of the Supreme Court. And these are the situations in which, as I mentioned before, there are concurrent terms in office for justices. And therefore, a majority of the court or all of the court finishes their terms at the same time. And so this kind of opens the opportunity for parties to appoint new justices, right? Except that in this case, there is no need to justify the appointments. There is no, no need to justify the, the reconstitution of the court because it is ju happening just because of constitutional design. So there is no need to legitimize the, the reconstitution of the court in a way. And so this is an interesting, in a way, placebo test because it's a situation in which politicians have the opportunity to reconstitute the ideological profile of the court but they do not need to justify doing so. And what we find in situations of concurrent terms is that in years when a majority of the court leaves the court simply because the constitution mandates them to do so, whether that happens under a party on the right or a party on the left, it doesn't make any difference, right? The number of, of women in the court does not change at all. So this is some preliminary indication that the element of the strategic element of justification for the appointment of women is crucial for left parties to when they appoint women, right? It's not just a, a sincere motivation, which may be present, of course, but, but there seems to be a, an element of, of strategic justification for, for the appointment of women in the courts. And so if this is the case, then the, the implicit question is, well, is this going to last, right? How, how 
how sustainable is this, the appointment of, of these women to the court? Um, and this leads to the question of the long-term effects of those judicial reshuffles. In, when I showed you the, the early evidence, I showed you that the, there seems to be some decline in those effects over time. But when we have the dynamic models, then we can, because the, the effects of the initial shock, the initial reshuffle are, is carried over time by the lag of the dependent variable, we can analyze the effect not only in the short run, in the immediate aftermath of the reshuffle, but we can also analyze the effect of those changes over the long run in terms of the proportion of women um, in the courts. And so what we are observing here is the short-term marginal effect that, that I just showed you in the previous graph um, for, the, for the increase in the percentage of women in the court based on the fixed effects models, right? So it's, as, as you saw before, is about 4.5% uh, reshuffle is conducted by the left and about 0.9% and non-significant when the purse is conducted by the right. Um, if we look at the Arellano bond models, the effects are very similar. I didn't show you that in the previous graph, but it's about, the effect is about, about 5% for purchase from the left and, and less than 1% in significant for purchase conducted by the right. Now, these are the short-term marginal effects, right? But we can, because there, this is a dynamic model, we can estimate the long-term effects based on the, on the long-run multiplier. And so when we, we estimate the long-term implications of these purges over the long run, in terms of the accumulated percentage of women that in the, in the, in the high course that we would observe over, over the long run as a result of those reshuffles, what you can see is that the, the long-run multiplier is about between 12 and 16 percent right, in the case of, of purchase conducted by the left. So it's, it's clearly larger than 5 percent, but it's still very far away from any implication of, of parity. Right? And so this, this leads to, to my, in a way, to my conclusion. Um, what, we are, what we are observing in a way is that weak institutions in the case of Supreme Courts, just as we know in the, about the, the cases of, of uh, um, say, legislatures following civil wars and other situations, weak institutions may open an opportunity for um, women and other disadvantaged groups to access power because the, the, disrupt, the institutional disruption, of course, um, removes all the elites, entrenched elites from power. The question in a way, and going back to the initial uh, blog post by, by Horacio Arbitsky in Argentina, the, the strategic question in a way is whether it is worth undermining institution to create those spaces for women or, or other underprivileged groups to access power. In the case of Supreme Courts and based on the experience of Latin America, the answer to that is probably not, because what we see is that certainly the, the the reshuffling of, of Supreme Courts undermines the independence of the judiciary and, and, and weakens um, judicial independence, right? So that's, that's one negative side effect. But the, 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 uh, the other aspect is that, as far as we can see, the, the improvements for women in the high courts as a result of having left parties in office and conducting those purges, those purges seems to be an improvement that is limited in terms of the, the magnitude of the size and tends to be declining over time. So it seems that weak institutions, when conducted by the right party, when, when taken advantage of by the right party, may create spaces for, for more incorporation, more inclusion. But when that inclusion is based on weak institutions, that inclusion seems to be hardly sustainable. So probably relying on weak institutions, on taking advantage of weak institutions to produce greater incorporation for women or any other disadvantaged groups is probably a, not, a, not a very reliable strategy and successful strategy over the long run. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, so thank you. We're opening it up to questions because of numbers. 
the easiest way to do questions is to put your question in the chat and then either I can queue or Anibal, since you can access the chat, you can respond to the questions. But we can open the floor. Sorry, I have a question. I was yeah, trying to raise my hand, but then <laughs> I did something else. So thank you, Aníbal. I really um, enjoyed the paper. So I have just, I guess, one common question, and it has something to do with perceptions of corruption, right? Um, and the, the background to this is that, like, I'm familiar, there's some literature that talks about how women, right, when we're, when we're thinking about police reform, right, that um, a general preference for ha having women in the police force because they are seen, they're perceived to be less corrupt than men, right? So is that something that is perceptions of corruption itself? Is that something that is talked about in, in, in this literature about appointing judges? Uh, yes, I think one of the reasons why um, the, so one of the reasons why it's, it, it may be a, a After, so, so let me put it this way. The, the logic here is that parties in government um, quite often want to remove the existing ju justices from office because sometimes many, in many cases for bad reasons, simply because they want to gain political control over the court, in some cases for good reasons, right? Because those judges may be corrupt and so on. But even if there is no clear evidence of corruption for the previous justices, the reason, among the many reasons to appoint women for for the for the new the the open vacancies in the court, uh, one of the arguments may be um, gender principles, right? The, the search for parity, and so in that sense, it seems that the constituencies of parties in the left may have a distinct preference for that, and that's why we theorize that parties in the left will be more willing to do this, but. The other, the other argument, uh, as you point out, is that sometimes women are, are seen as less contaminated by traditional politics and, and less corrupt. So this, this is another incentive that even if parties are doing this for strategic reasons, maybe a good justification to appoint women um, to the court. Now, this kind of justification actually could be invoked by any party, right? So it, it doesn't have to be by parties on the left. So, um, parties on the right who may not have a, a, an audience that has a distinct preference for for parity necessarily um, may may also invoke this this reason. So if that's that mechanism in a way would work a little bit against the, the interaction we are we are theorizing. Okay, Felix, you have a question in the chat. Oh, Virginia has her hand raised. Yes. Um, I, let me let me just look at the question in the chat. Were the estimate presented at the GMM estimators? Yes. And if so, okay, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so so there are there are several, yes. Yeah, so the, these questions about the the specific test for the GMM models. Um, I think I, we have some of them uh, specifically reported in the in the appendix to the paper, but I would I would need to check the details for that. Um, certainly, yes. Um, I, I'm sorry I cannot respond more specifically about the results because I, I don't I don't remember the details at the top of my head. But I think we reported those when we when we were working on the on the appendix to the paper. Uh, Virgin, Virginia. Thank you so much for uh, such an interesting presentation. I have a, a, a short um, comment and a short question as well. Um, could you tell us which are the countries that have concurrent terms? So I was wondering whether you know there might be some countries like pushing that result because it seems like an odd result to be to be honest. 
And the other um, short comment inspired by the presence of Santiago Andrea here is that the argument really, really remind me of what happened with the public administration with Evo Morales and how patronage allowed um, you know, the government of Evo Morales to allow a, a, a more diverse representation among public employees. And basically because there was no civil service system. So, uh, you know, it would, be, it would be nice to see this, this type of argument sort of explore other uh, marginalized um, groups as well. Yeah, um, no, thanks, thanks for, the, for the reference to that. Um, the, I, don't, I, I don't recall all the countries that have um, concurrent terms and that varies that I think that varies over time in different countries because it's a long period but there are a few that come to mind because they have concurrent terms now I think there are some cases in which in Central America in which say the the terms for justices are aligned are five-year terms and they tend to be aligned with the term for the president so that's kind of a fantastic model for the president right because it means that it's very easy to reconstitute the the Supreme Court or the Constitutional Court. Um, I think Bolivia at some point had something like that in the past, early in the 20th century. Um, but but those some of those models have, have changed over time. So I, it's possible that the number of cases is relatively small. So that may be part of the story for why this, this result is, is slightly different. Uh, but, it, but clearly the number of cases of, of, uh, of packing courts is also small, right? And, and we see a, a clear separation there. So it seems that the, the logic of political operations to expand the court and situations in which you just have the freedom to, to appoint your, your judges because the constitution allows you to do so creates different incentives. Um, on the issue of the bureaucracy, I, I hadn't thought about the bureaucracy, but I, I think this is, a, this is a great example, yes, in which um, having fewer restrictions allows much greater flexibility to incorporate new sectors into, into public office and public jobs if you have the right person selecting those, those uh, officials in, in, in power, right? So there is the, the interaction between the weakness of the institution and the, and the, and the right selector, so to speak. Of course, the, the trick is, and I think this is the, the the point I am trying to make to some extent is that weak institutions can be, and the achievements in weak institutions can be easily undone because just the next person can, can probably change some of that. Anuel, thank you. That was very interesting. The, um, if I recall correctly, you, you said that you categorized the executive on the left using a multipoint scale. Um, yes. And, and so does that mean that there is a degree of leftness um, implicit in, in that categorization? And does it matter? Uh, yes, actually, that, that's a great question. So we, we combine, uh, there is no kind of universally accepted way of classifying Latin American government, right? So we combine multiple measures. I, I think one of them in which Virginia was part was, was a, an accomplice many years ago. Um, and we can and, and different measures for political parties for governments in office um, and so and so we combine all of those measures and try to create kind of a unified average um, and and so it means that and then we, we dichotomize the measures simply for simplicity in the analysis right so we distinguish left governments from from kind of non-left governments but we also conducted the analysis using the continuous measure and and the interaction doing the continuous measure and the, let me see if I can show the results. I, I may have them here. Um, no, I cannot share the screen now. Uh, but but um, essentially, we, it's the results are less in a way less clear because at the extremes, extreme right or extreme left, there are fewer cases, so the the confidence intervals for the predictions are broader. But we essentially find the, the same pattern, which is that in, in the continuous measure as as parties in power moves towards the left, uh, or as, rather as parties in power moves toward the right, their, their, like, their willingness to appoint women following a reshuffle declines. Um, what is interesting, however, is that when we use the continuous measure, it seems that parties in the middle, parties in the center may also be willing to, 
to appoint women in some cases. So depending on how we, we estimate it. So it may be not just a phenomenon of parties on the left, but maybe more, more broad and inclusive to some parties at, at the center. Is that measure described in, in the paper? Uh, yes. Okay, good. Uh, we we just uh, were considering a, a, a paper yesterday in an internal seminar, and this was a matter of discussion. Uh, and so it it, uh, it might be something we will suggest to the authors uh, to look at your at your classification. Wonderful. And our our data is online, so it's available. So the the combined measure for the for what this work is is available in the paper as well. Thank you. Camilo. Thank you so much for the interesting presentation. Um, so I, I really like the uh, the argument and the conclusion that um, so sort of weak institutions provide opportunities for you know for these changes, but they're also like very easily undone. So, but my question was more about the consequences of these uh, changes. So I know this you know it's a different sort of independent uh, dependent variable that would that you would be considering, but um, I was wondering if these changes in percentage of women um, in courts um, actually um, have an implication for you know better you know better types of decisions and and if these um, you know subsequent reshuffles also imply a retraction of rights so if you could talk more a little bit about uh, a little bit more about that yeah um, there is some discussion about this in the literature on, on judicial politics of course and we do not, I have not seen any analysis for the courts we are discussing, for, for the Latin American courts we are, we are discussing at, at, this, at this level, right? Given the, the large number of courts and large number of decisions. Um, I think there is some evidence that, that women in courts make different, a difference, not, not simply because they rule on different in certain types of, of issues, but, but sometimes because they, they have, they bring different ideas about about the law and so on. So, so I would expect if if I could measure this, and and as we collect more data on different projects, collect more data on, on judicial rulings for these courts, I think eventually it will be possible. Um, I would expect to see some difference, um, and I, and that on, on the side, the gender side. Um, now on the on the reshuffle side, which is the other side of your question, I would certainly expect to see some effects for civil liberties and political rights in cases, particularly in cases in which uh, those reshuffles become a systematic pattern in some countries. So what happens, I think, is that the first reshuffle of a Supreme Court is hard to do but the second is much easier and the third is much easier, right? So there is a, there is a process by which courts get politicized and they lose their prestige. And so it's, it's very easy to politicize them again. Um, and, so in, and so in those cases, I would expect to see sort of a, a downward war spiral in which the judges are less willing to protect the rights of the opposition, for example, in general. Well, it looks like this was perfectly timed <laughs> uh, as we're coming uh, around uh, the hour. Um, are there any other questions uh, for anybody? Last call. Well, hearing none then, um, I will just uh, reiterate our thanks uh, for a very, very interesting presentation. Um, and thanks to Kate for putting this together. Uh, Aníbal, and, and the invitation stands for an in-person visit when circumstances Thank you. permit. Thank you. I, I certainly look forward to it. Thank you all for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you, Aníbal. Bye. Aníbal and Camilo, um, if you want to move up your meeting since